Hey guys, Mr. Jansen here, here to take you through um, 21 through 30 of the 100 illustrated ways to pass the readings exam. So let's get started. Number 21, planets appear to go backwards as the Earth passes them in space. Okay, so this is called retrograde motion. Um, it is kind of an interesting concept because the planet will appear to kind of do almost like a little circle in the sky. It'll appear to go backwards, okay? And that's due to the fact that each of the planets have a different orbital velocity or basically a different revolution speed, okay? So in other words, um, the Earth will travel a little faster because it's closer to the Sun, so at certain points it's going to look like Mars is in front of us, and then at certain points it's going to look like Mars is behind us. And in the sky, that's going to make it look like something like this, okay? It's going to, obviously, Mars will be kind of be going and going and going and going and going, and then all of a sudden it'll start to appear to go backwards, okay? Once again, Mars isn't going backwards, it just appears to be going backwards due to the different revolution speeds of the planets, okay? So let's see this as a practice question, okay? Um, on the regions, it may appear as this. An observer views a planet from space over a period of time as Earth passed a planet in which a direction should the planet seem to have moved. So well, as Earth passes the planet, okay, it's actually going to appear to be going retrograde or be going backward, okay, or choice B, as indicated here. 22, uh, the summer solstice, uh, June 21st, winter solstice, December 21st, the equinoxes are March 21st and September 23rd. Those are your major dates. You need to know your four major dates and all the basically stats that go along with them. If you were to see it as a regions question, it may appear like this. On June 21st, some Earth locations have 24 hours of daylight. These locations are all between the latitudes of what? Okay, 24 hours of daylight, that's pretty significant. That means that, you know, the sun's up for 24 straight hours. Where on Earth is that going to happen? On June 21st, it's going to happen by the pole, okay? Or in between 66 and a half degrees north and 90 degrees north, okay? Great. Uh, moving right along, let's go to number 23. To an observer in the mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere facing north, uh, stars appears to make a complete circle around Polaris. So, these again are called circumpolar stars, okay? They appear going to go around Polaris because Polaris is the North Star. It's directly above the North Pole. So, it's really going to barely move in the sky. It's basically not going to appear to move. All the other stars are going to appear to move around it, okay? If you're facing north, it's going to look something like this, okay? Um, if you're facing south, it's going to obviously look something like this because you really can't see Polaris if you're, if you're facing south. Okay, um, and there is no south star. And if you're facing east, it's, it's going to look like this because everything in the sky, the moon, the stars, the sun, all appear to rise in the east and set in the west. If you were to see this as a region's question, it may appear something like this. Okay, um, Based on observations made in the northern hemisphere, which statement is best supporting evidence that the Earth rotates on its axis? Okay, How do we know the Earth is spinning? Okay. Well, these circumpolar stars are great evidence, or the fact that the stars appear to do a circular path around Polaris, or choice four. Okay? Great. Blue shift, red shift. Okay, blue shift is when the object's getting closer to the Earth. Okay, red shift is when the object's getting further from the Earth. Okay? So, that's the part you kind of need to memorize. Obviously, the science is a little more complex than that. Okay? Um, it could be you know, explained by using sound waves and the fact that when an object's moving closer to you, the sound waves are getting closer, so you have a higher frequency. So it's going to give off like a higher pitch. If the object's moving away from you, it's going to, the waves are going to move further apart. So you know, obviously, a decreased frequency. So it'll sound lower in pitch, kind of like an, an ambulance or a car, a race car, that kind of that, that, like, that high to low pitch noise is indicating the, how the sound waves move. And that's related to um, you know, the blue shift and red shift because uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, obviously the, um, the waves are a little closer together when you're talking about being blue in color and a little farther away when you're talking about being red in color. Okay. If you were to see this as a region's question, it may appear something like this. Okay. Based on the redshift data on Galaxy, most astronomers infer that the universe is currently what? Redshift means the object's moving away from you, so that's um, an indication that the universe is expanding, Okay, or choice D. Great, moving right along. Um, number 25, the equator always has 12 hours of daylight. Always, always, always. Okay. A good thing to remember with this is equator, equinox, equal. Okay. Um, you know, all those EQU words you want to kind of associate with one another because um, it will always have 12 hours of daylight regardless of the day of the year, okay? Okay, if you were to see this as regions question, uh, it may appear something like this. Maybe here's a world map. It says base your answer 36 to 38 in the world map below. 
you have A, B, C, and D. And let's scroll down to number 37 here. Which location receives 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness on June 21st? Okay, so June 21st, everyone knows it's the summer solstice, and in the northern hemisphere, we'll have more hours of daylight, but at the equator is where you're going to have equal. So which choice is at the equator? Looks like choice C. So choice C is going to be your answer here. Okay, great. Uh, number 26, the lower the altitude of the sun, the longer the shadow it casts. Okay? This can be interpreted both in a seasonal fashion and in a um, daily fashion. Okay? Obviously, in a seasonal fashion, the, in the summer, the sun is higher in the sky, okay? so it's going to cast a shorter shadow. All right? But in the winter, it's lower in the sky, so it's going to have a longer shadow. If you think about this with regards to a daily motion, in the morning and in the evening, the sun is low in the sky. So in the morning and evening, it will cast a long shadow. But in the afternoon, it will cast a shorter shadow because it's higher in the sky. So depending upon the question will depend upon, obviously, which shadow length you want to pick. Um, if we're talking about this being a Regents question, it says, which path of the sun would result in the longest shadow of the vertical post at solar noon? So this is a little intimidating to look at. You know, you have your angles, you have all the sun's path. But you just want the one that's going to cast uh, the longest shadow, which means it's lowest in the sky. So which path has the sun lowest in the sky? Okay, and that's going to be choice A, or A to A prime, just like that. Okay, 27. The Coriolis effect uh, results from the Earth's rotation. Uh, the focal pendulum illustrates the Coriolis effect and so proves the Earth's rotation. Okay, so once again, um, you want to know evidence for Earth's rotation? Think Coriolis effect, think focal pendulum. Okay, those are the two that you re they really like to ask about. Um, technically, the Coriolis effect is the deflection of particles to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. But what, what we're trying to show you with that is because the object is spinning, it's going to you know, basically get a curved path, kind of like indicated here. We're, we're, we're dropping a ball on a spinning disk, and because the disk is spinning, it's getting deflected. Okay. Same thing with the Foucault pendulum. Once again, the Foucault pendulum over time will actually, you know, appear to change the path in which it's swinging. So a common question, you know, with regards to this stuff um, is basically uh, the diagram below represents the Foucault pendulum swinging freely for eight hours. The Foucault pendulum appears to gradually change its direction of swing due to Earth's what? So once again, we're talking about the spinning of Earth. Okay, we're talking about choice four. Okay, great. Number 28, Earth is closer to the sun in the winter. Okay, we have perihelion and aphelion. This, when students first learn about this, they're a little, you know, confused by that. But once again, it's not the distance between the Earth and the sun that's causing the seasons, okay? It's basically the tilt, okay? So technically, all right, we're actually a little closer to the sun at perihelion around January 3rd, okay? And we're actually further from the sun on, on July 4th at aphelion. Okay, so once again, you know, if we're going to see this as a region's question, it may appear something like this. Um, in the northern hemisphere, which season does the Earth reach its greatest distance from the sun? Greatest distance means you're furthest away. So when are we furthest away from the sun? Okay, as we said before, it's going to be the summertime, which sounds weird. But once again, it's the tilt that causes the seasons, not the distance between the Earth and the sun. Number 29, the closer the planet is to the sun, the higher its velocity and the further the planet is from the sun, okay, and the slower its velocity. So this is Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, basically, when an object gets closer to the star, it's going to move faster, and then when it's further, it's going to move slower. It's using the gravitational pull of the object, so, when it's, so it's really going to whip around at you know, point D, and then it's really going to slow down or move its slowest at point B. Okay, so here it's speeding up, okay, here it's kind of slowing down, okay, just like that. If you're going to see this as a question on the region, it says, Earth is farthest from the sun during the northern hemisphere's summer, and Earth is closest to the sun during the northern hemisphere's winter. During which season is the northern hemisphere's Earth's orbital velocity the greatest? So when are we moving the fastest? Okay, so when are we closest to the sun? Well, we're actually closest to the sun, as we said before, in the wintertime, okay, so it's going to be choice one. Number 30, the sun is one foci on an ellipse. There is nothing at the other foci, okay? Kepler as well as the planetary motion again, all right? Um, once again, uh, basically when you've done this lab in class, you had the two tacks, you put it in the cardboard, you take the string, and you draw it around, okay? So just to know from here is that the further the foci are apart, the more um, eccentric the orbit, okay? And then the closer the tacks are together, you know, the more circular the orbit, okay? 
and you know obviously it's more eccentric then it's going to be more stretched out so it's going to have a higher eccentricity if it's more circular it's going to have a lower eccentricity i mean one way to remember that is the number well, zero looks like a circle, so it has a low eccentricity, and then number one looks like a straight line, so it has a high e e eccentricity. So as the eccentricity approaches one, it's more stretched out. As it approaches zero, it's more circular. If we're going to look at this as a regions question, okay, it may appear something like this. In our solar system, the orbits of the planets are best described as, well, once again, our, all our orbits are slightly elliptical uh, with the sun at one of the foci, or choice C. Okay. Um, that takes us through number 30. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for our next video.